Everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Super Data Brothers Super Show. That's right. I am Ryan. I am Eric. And we are two real life brothers who work it's in true. the data and analytics industry. And have we got a good one for you today, folks? Boy, do we. You know, Ryan, I'm so excited for today's show because uh, I think we just have a really interesting guest, Joe Reese. I'm sure many of you watching have heard of him. And I think we've got a really interesting topic uh, why data skills beat data tools. Because, you know, we've all either been in that point in a career or seen someone point a career where they, they know a single tool and then that tool dies and then, well, what do you do now? So I just think it's a really interesting uh, topic of discussion. I'm looking really forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. So um, before we bring Joe on, we got a couple points of order to, to talk about today. Uh, so let's just get into it. Tools for Fools with Joe Reese. Okay, so first point of order, meet the Super Data Brothers. That's right. We are coming up at a couple events. You can catch me at DBT Coalesce, October 16th through 19th. As many of you know, I am the VP of Product Strategy at Good Data, and we are sponsoring Coalesce this year. So make sure you swing by and say hello. Uh, I will be bringing a limited number of the coveted Super Data Brothers t-shirt with me. And so uh, you're going to want to come by and say hi early if you want to grab one of those, because uh, there are not many of them. They are hard to find. Um, and then, of course, Day-to-Day -day Texas. We love Day-to-Day -day Texas here at the Super Data Brothers show. You'll be able to catch Joe uh, at Day-to-Day -day Texas as well. It's January 27th, 2024. Awesome conference, one-day event, super chill, laid back. You really get, um, my favorite thing about it is, is kind of how practical it all is and how yeah. little vendor BS there is at this one. Yeah, not much, not much sales pitch. So like, you actually get good info, and like, it'll the, the, there be people uh, from vendors giving presentations, but you won't even know who they're from till the very end. So it's like just very good info. Absolutely. All right, and then uh, some event in Detroit TBD this fall. We're still putting something together. I've been talking with Aaron Wilkerson, uh, who's also a, a fellow Detroiter. Some of you may know mm -hmm. uh, to get together some kind of Detroit data meetup. Lots of cities have a data meetup scene. It is time we get one in the Motor City. So uh, mm -hmm. look forward to that if you are in the area. Um, all right. One thing I'm noticing, Eric, I don't think, uh, I think we've had a LinkedIn integration fail. I don't know if we've gone live on LinkedIn. Um, really? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we will persevere. This, these are the trials and tribulations of a live show. Let me just check real quick to see if I can figure out what is going on with that. Yeah, it says we're still pre-live. So um, unfortunately, I think uh, our LinkedIn audience is maybe not aware of where to find us. So let me just drop into the LinkedIn chat the link for YouTube real quick. And hopefully some of them will catch it and come over here. You know, we were talking with Joe before the show about all the challenges. We've had like all sorts of integration challenges all of a sudden uh, with uh, the tool we use for live streaming and LinkedIn. And it's just been, uh, you know, it's a never ending journey here when you're uh, when you're doing these live shows. So let me just grab this link and I'll post it on LinkedIn. And then we will uh, we will bring Joe on. To talk about today's topic. All right. Just dropping this onto LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn uh, kind of sucks sometimes. So <laughs> you said it. All right. All right. We've got that posted. So um, yep. Hopefully we got some people from LinkedIn 
coming over. We see Mike Norris. Hello from sunny and warm Ottawa. Yeah, good to see you again. Aaron Wilkerson in the chat. All the cool kids will be at Day to Day Texas. Of course, Aaron will be there too. Listen, if you are interested in Day to Day Texas, go ahead and uh, use the code Super Data Brothers, all one word, to get a discount on your registration. Um, all right. So, one last thing be before we bring Joe on. Of course, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Digital Hive. What is Digital Hive? Uh, you may be asking yourself. Well, it's an analytics catalog, okay? You may be familiar with the term data catalog. A data catalog, of course, catalogs your data assets, the tables and fields in your databases, for example. An analytics catalog catalogs the analytical outputs, the charts, the graphs, the visualizations, dashboards, and reports, and brings them all into one place so that it's easy for people to find, okay? If you are working at the enterprise level in data in 2023, you know that you are probably supporting three, four, five BI tools and that your users have to navigate all those different endpoints to find the data they need. Digital Hive makes it easy to bring all of those things together into a single collaborative portal that lets you combine elements of different BI tools on the fly. So chart from Tableau, chart from Power BI, bring them together into a single dashboard where a single filter can filter both of those charts at once. It's very cool. Makes it easy to find assets from any system easily. And from my point of view, as someone who's been doing enterprise BI for over a decade, it actually, one of the best things is it gives you a view into what people are actually doing across these systems because it combines the usage statistics from these systems into one place. And if you're not doing BI on your BI, you're doing it wrong, let me tell you, okay? So um, Digital Hive, longtime fan of the show. I've been working with these guys forever. You may be familiar with um, their other project called Modio, which gives you a lot of great auditing tools and and administrator tools for Click and Power BI and Cognos. They also have a conference coming up called Jazz Up Your Analytics in New Orleans from October 30th to November 1st. This is an OBS conference for analytics leaders focused on helping you embrace DevOps for analytics, which is something that we're big fans of here at the show. So check out Digital Hive, check out Jazz Up Your Analytics. Um, and thank you to Digital Hive for your sponsorship of the show. Okay. Any last words before we bring uh, we bring Joe on? Uh, no, uh, basically that's about it. Uh, if you want to give a give where you're tuning in from in the comments, we'll give you a shout out. But besides yeah. that, I think we're ready. To bring on Joe. All right, Joe. Welcome to Super Data Show. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, of course, we've got this little LinkedIn integration snafu, but I do see we got some people coming over. Oh, it happens all the time. Stuff. So one thing, so if you had to reschedule your event, for example, yeah, um, the uh, yeah, it gets super flaky if that happened. And then the yeah, other didn't, thing, didn't you have to do that? Didn't you something with that, Ryan? With like the time yeah. was wonky. Yeah, 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 I had to reschedule. It. And then you, then the other thing is that before every show, I always reconnect to um, LinkedIn on Streamyard. Yeah, I should. Well, integration is. <laughs> Pretty shit. So. Flaky. Yeah. Clearly yes. I should have done that this time. It's it's so don't worry uh, about it. Yep. It's, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. We'll uh we'll make sure we get the YouTube link out there after the fact. So don't worry about it. Um good to have you here, man. I know you've been all over the world lately, uh traveling in, in support of uh fundamentals of data engineering. So for anybody in our audience who who maybe isn't familiar with your work, like what, what's your background? How did you get to where you are in, in the data world? Yeah, I guess, you know, I've always worked in data in some capacity or another, um, been in it for, geez, 20 plus years now. So, um, yeah, I mean, kind of run the gamut of, of you know, different uh, jobs and responsibilities, ranging from being an IC to being, you know, to running companies and kind of everything in between with, I guess, probably touch every area of data. I don't know if there's an area I probably haven't touched. So, uh, yeah. My experience I can go on and on and on, but then you know, wrote a book and uh, that launched last year and uh, it got pretty popular. Um, so exchange after that. What was the um, when you so when you you, you and, and Matt Housley, uh, who's yeah. the, the co author of, of Fundamentals mm -hmm. of, of Data Engineering, what was the first sign do you remember that that you had a hit on your hands? Um I think in the back of our heads, we always thought it would be, um, you know, uh, it was going to be a hit. I mean, I, I just have this like weird sixth sense of like timing things, right? And, and I, 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 it, I just felt like with the uh, ascendance of data engineering, sort of in general, right? Um, you know, I felt like this was a very good time. You know, if you, if you surf, if you're a surf, you can kind of see 
I guess you tell like that wave up there looks like it's gonna be pretty good. Um, that's how I felt about uh, the book. And then early early times while we were writing it, was the book was a number one to release several months before it came out in in several categories, right? So that's I mean, you want to talk about an amount of like, a huge amount of pressure being put on you as well. Um, that's uh, yeah, writing and knowing that it has to be really good. I, I suppose. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I just check. I just checked LinkedIn, and we are live in LinkedIn. So okay, good. So um, data nerds. Hey, well, all right. People uh, are starting to show up. I see. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yay. Good, good to see you. Only like 10 minutes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. All right. Um, friend of the show, uh, Shantona coming in. Uh, I think we're going to maybe have her on again in November to talk about um, uh, analytics as code and data contracts. So I look oh, yeah, forward to she's that. She's a good guest. Yep. Yeah, man. She's awesome. I, uh, she's, uh, I love her. Um, so, so how so fundamentals of data engineering comes out um, and the, uh, obviously it's been a huge hit the reception uh, has been has been tremendous what what's it been like riding that wave man I know you've been all over the world like in the last month it seems mm -hmm. yeah it's literally all over the world in the last month I, <laughs> I think I've, I've toured the world probably a, a few times this year um, uh, and then about to actually go to, to India and Dubai in a couple of days and then get back and then go back to Europe a couple weeks later and then continue, continue, continue. Um, but the wave's been fun, you know, I think to kind of rewind to where it was last year. I mean, the, um, there's always a ton of interest in the, uh, the ideas of the book and, and what's been interesting is seeing the adoption of it. You know, I, I mean, there's plenty of universities that are adopting it as their core text, uh, you know, data engineering curriculum is now a thing, which wasn't the case while writing it. It was still a pretty budding topic. It seems like every big company in the universe seems to have a book club or something involved with it. I, I talked to people from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, where else? Um, I mean, after name a company, it's, it's interesting to see who's, uh, who's Apple, right? So it's like just uh, a, lot of, a lot of big companies, a lot of small companies are using it. So it's, I think that's been really cool to see, right? It's just, um, you know, getting onto LinkedIn every day and just seeing pictures of, of People posting about the book and the, the concepts they're learning, I think, is it. So that's that's like the most rewarding thing. It's just seeing that, you know, you could definitely have a I think positive impact on people in, in that way. That's that to me is like the best part of it. So the traveling is just it, it, it's just part of the gig. But to me, um, you know, I would be perfectly content just just seeing that people are getting a lot of value out of the book. So yeah, cool. that's that's got to be hugely rewarding. I know that it's. Um... It seems like pretty much everybody is reading it or has read it in the data space. It's had a huge splash. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to you and Matt you. on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, one of the, you know, they were kind of we we uh, intentionally went for a slightly trollish title for uh, for this yeah, episode. So the, the I, I worked on that thumbnail. All right, I worked. <laughs> yeah, <That's good>. <laughs> <laughs> the data. I wasn't tools. sure to put. I wasn't. Sure, I wasn't sure to put the, whether or not to put a jester hat on you or not. So I figured. <laughs> I, I figured I'd frame it as that me and Ryan are the jesters, and you're the the guy with the cool glasses. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, um, the data tools for data fools was what we went with. And I, I think the question there is like, um, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek, but really it's, I, I, it's really this idea of, you know, what is it that we should be fo like focusing on now in, in 2023 and what are the big gaps that we need to close as data practitioners? Right. And, and of course, you know, the vendors are all out there, doing what vendors do, which is, hey, your, you know, your problems can mm -hmm. be solved by adopting our tool or our, our way of thinking. But how do you see that? Like, what is the biggest challenge that we have this year? I think it's the same challenge we've had for a long time. You know, the, the so I'll tell you what the challenge is not, I would say. Right, let's start with that. So invert the question and say, what, what aren't the challenges? Uh, I don't think there's a lack of tooling hmm. right now. Especially when we're trying to, so, so I need to caveat this um, by saying that to solve traditional analytical workload problems, stuff that we've been working on for the past, you know, um, well, since data warehousing came about, and arguably uh, earlier than that, um, you know, if you fast forward to today, problems involving the data warehousing space, which I would I'd consider the um, analytical analytics for, uh, you know, management decision making, as Bill would put it. That to me, the tooling is very much solved at this point. I, you know, tell me. I think right now we're hair splitting on nuances, but tools that address the general problem, I think, is largely solved. Um, and so, 
I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So I, as I said, my podcast, um, Five Minute Friday, the other day, I was walking around a conference. Uh, it was a big day in London. You know, and a friend comes up to me in the morning right before the conference opened, and he's like, it seems like everybody here's a feature. A lot of these, these small vendors are features. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, you're right. You are. And at that point, then what's, you know, if, if you're, in the, if you're, um, if you're hair splitting over what, what features to use, I, I would say that, um, you know, you can make an argument that, hey, we've, we've solved the problem, right? So if I were to look at it from the tool perspective and say that because we have tools that can solve basically every problem uh, for analytics, therefore we've solved it. However, the crux is that we're still ranting and raving about the same problems we've been raving about mm-hmm. for the last 30 years. So I don't think it's a tooling problem at this point. I, I in fact, think there are too many tools. If you look at Matt Turk's mad data uh, landscape from yeah. um, this year, right? Over 1,400 companies on that. And that's not even, uh, I think, half or, or, you know, third of them, right? So that's, you know, so I think what's what's going on now is, it, is it's, it's part of the symptomatic of the, um, you know, the boom times that we went through where there's easy money flowing for the last decade, especially in the, you know, during COVID. It seemed like anybody who had a pulse and a term sheet could get money. Um, you know, so that's, that's part of the... Uh, Part of the question. So, but I, yeah. So when I when I look back, okay. So why are we so ranting about the same stuff, right? To me, that 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 that's indicative that we've been we've been focusing too much on uh, technology to solve our problems and not as much on understanding either the problem we're trying to solve or upscaling ourselves to solve those problems. And and I think to best use the tools at our disposal at our capacity. And I'll give you another example real quick. Some of the most performing performant data teams I've ever worked with and seen. Uh, we're using nothing more than Excel. This is back in the uh, back in the day, right? So they're able to deliver quote business value, uh, and so um, they didn't have a fancy uh, modern data stack with uh, all the bells and whistles, and yet they're still delivering pound for pound more value than I'm seeing people deliver right now. So that's that's basically what I'm noticing. And what was it like in that example? You know, what what was it that enabled them to do that with just Excel? Because I think a lot of people would say, you know, that that is, uh, in my experience, many a data person's dream is that their users will, especially in the BI space where I've spent most of my time, that like, oh, we're going to get rid of Excel. We got to get these people out of Excel and into the BI interface or into, you know, whatever. What was it that made this team so highly performant with just Excel? I think it's because at the time, and I was one one of those teams, we, we weren't focused on data. And it's as its own means and end, right? We were focused on business outcomes. We were focusing on developing the domain expertise and the functions we were trying to serve and then serving those functions, working alongside the stakeholders, understanding what's going to move the needle and, and um, I think providing you know the proper either analysis or I guess quote data science back in the day, which is just fancy statistics. Um, to help them, uh, you know, better understand the problems that we're being uh, faced with, and much better help solve them, right? So, to me, it's not so much. And I, I think I wrote about this the other day, um, but I, I think, a, a, you know, you, you get a competent person with deep domain expertise and, and good analytical chops. You could give them any tool; they're going to be more highly performant than somebody who doesn't know, you know, crap from Shinola to give them a flight, you know, and. Uh, you know, the fanciest tools out there. Pound for pound, I'm gonna bet every single time on the person who's got, who's competent, understands the domain, you know, and has the, uh, you know, analytical and uh, tech and math chops to back it up. So I'll bet on that person 100% of the time. And I think we have, you know, this, I mean, this kind of, to your point, you know, Gajendra here asks, hey, so what tools should newcomers focus on apart from SQL, Excel, and BI tools? And I think maybe, your point is that that's not the right way to think about it. Yeah, I think, and I wanted to highlight this because I see it as the question as well. And, and it's, um, I think it's definitely, I think it's a good question if you're new because you're going to focus on tools. But I think yeah. the, the old saying goes, it's, it's you know, beginners focus on tools, you know, experts focus on why, you know, and then you figure out what you need to do from there. But so I'd say, you know, the, the best tool you can have is, is your, um, your eyes and ears and, and learning to listen, learning to pay attention. You know, it's something where I, you know, when I entered the field, it was, you know, I come out thinking I'm smart as hell. Um, nobody, nobody cares. Yeah. Right? They, just want to, they want to see results. So you can show how smart you are by, by paying attention to people and understanding their needs and then delivering on those. Right. So I think this is this is a good example of maybe the wrong question to ask. 
Exactly. And it is, I mean, it's easy, like you said, newcomers, um, it feels tangible. I think when you, when you're just new to this field, you know, that is something you know yeah. how to go out and learn, right. I can go learn Alteryx, just pick a tool off the top of my head. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, whereas the types of things you're talking about now, how would you recommend someone who's new to the field? How can they go about getting this type of experience, learning these, these types of skills? It's really hard, right? Because schools don't typically teach this. I teach at the school and this isn't really taught. So <laughs> right. I, mean, I try and teach students this, but there's only so much I can do, right? And so I think it's a general curriculum. The things I would, um, I wish would happen is more schools would pay attention to things like, you know, requirements gathering, understanding, you know, how to talk to stakeholders and so forth. I think that's the most underrated skill out there. Um, but okay, so say you're not taught that, right? Uh, it, it's a really tricky one because here's a couple of things. You're under the gun to get a job. So you're going to focus on tech skills. Yeah. Right. Um, and I would say lean into that. It's not, it's not like you need to, to definitely show the, your competency in listening today. Cause it's a very hard thing to communicate on a resume. I would say by, by maybe by showing a portfolio of like videos that you've done or, um, um, you know, maybe, you know, uh, allowing people to see your communication skills might be a good way to do it. But for the most part, you're going to have to show yourself on the job. Right. So I think some really, Good resources might be, um, you know, um, how to win friends and influence people by Andrew Carnegie that came out. Right? Dale Carnegie. Uh, <laughs> that, that's what that's so one like we, we bring up yeah. the number one data book of, of 2023. <laughs> that's a joke. Yeah, right. It's good. <laughs> but just pay attention. You know, just I would say like you know do cheap cheap things. Um, actually, going, I was going to say go to lunch. But that's not really cheap these days. It costs you about a hundred dollars to go get a uh, hamburger. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, you know, go take people to lunch. Just understand what they you know. Just listen to people. Go. Um, um, yeah, just I think the, the I can tell you the advice of how not to do this. Right? Maybe that's better. Is sit in your cubicle or at your um, couch all day if you're working remote. Uh, don't bother uh, getting to know anybody on your team. Don't bother getting to know your stakeholders. Right, but show a genuine interest. Don't just fake it either. You can leave the thing of uh, you know how to win friends and influence people. I think it's it's a it's a book that I think if you apply it correctly, it's good. But it can also come across as really corny because all you're doing is saying, um, Ryan. You know, and just repeating yeah. your name over and over again, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, and, and um, you know, not arguing with people and so forth, which are generally good good things to do. But I would say, uh, you know, just show a genuine interest in what you're trying to do and the people that you're trying to serve and, and work with. I think a lot of it takes care of itself. But yeah, I mean, if you're starting out, though, it's going to be really hard to express this unless you say you're a YouTuber, you know, or or you know, um, something like that. In which case, you're probably just going to be doing YouTube for a living and not getting a job. Uh, <laughs> even, even a lot of YouTubers I meet, I mean, they're, they're great on YouTube and they're awkward uh, in person. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like the, yeah. the worst people good to talk the, to. Good on the camera, not good in, uh, in the or happens all the time. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. You know, Aaron, Aaron Wilkerson posted something, I think, yesterday on LinkedIn that was really prescient to this conversation, which was like his biggest, one of his biggest pieces of advice was like, when you get asked to present in a meeting as a data person, don't just present and then leave. Like, try to stay, try to attend the whole meeting, listen to what oh, yeah. we're talking about, right? Um, I think a lot of times data people do get asked to, to, to show up and, okay, you know, show us the findings. Okay, thank you, Mr. or Mrs. Engineer, you know, you're done here and like resist the, you know, try to stay in the room and like hear what do they say about it? What do they care about? Why is this meeting going on and what were the outcomes? Oh yeah, I think his post was like, you don't want to be the special guest. Exactly. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> it's like, you're, like the uh, the clown that shows up for the birthday party or something. Um, uh -huh. So he was saying, but that's what I said. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely correct, right? And you, you get a lot of context. I mean, these are you know, especially when you're talking about exec meetings or higher, you know, um, meetings with higher ups. I mean, they're talking about a lot of things that impact the business. Things that you should probably know. You can choose to leave. I always chose to stuck around, right? Um, I think shortly, you know, my first job, I was. You know, at some point, I asked to sit outside the CEO's office, and and um, that was his uh, quote numbers guy, right? Anything you needed to know, any any piece of advice you needed, I was there. Which I think pretty ballsy gamble for a punk twenty something kid, but hey, that's how it goes. And but he trusted me, right? So that's what happens. Maybe some people recognize you, and they, they recognize you're you're not just another um, you know, doofus around the office. And they want to have you doofus outside of their their office instead. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you're <laughs> so, their doofus. <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> That's, so, there you go. There's career You're, you're the number one Reese. clown in the car. Be their baby. doofus. <laughs> yep. It's all about moving to the passenger seat there. So, uh, uh-huh. you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but the, yeah, the advice I think is it's, it's it's that's a good one. And Chantone had some good advice, you know, statistics, problem framing, decision criteria, yeah. what um, we should focus on. But I think that's that's good. You know, learn the underlying techniques. You know that, uh, that kind of underpin the stuff you may have learned in school. Um, and just Joe, so Aaron Wilkins just had a comment here. Joe Reese just called data presenters clowns. Uh, his words, not mine. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I blurred a lot. It's fine. Um, you, you'd also be magicians, okay? You, you could be uh, like, yeah. like, um, yeah, David Copperfield or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, who's that? Who's that magician in uh, Vegas? What is his name? The other one. Anyway, a bunch oh of them. yeah, I, I can picture him, but I can't. Uh, yeah, you could be the pen and teller of your office. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> that's um and actually so that, don't don't do that. Don't conjure up imaginary shit when you're talking to your <laughs> stakeholders. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. That's uh some slight some sleight of hand with the charts, you know. Yeah. We're profitable. <laughs> like a rabbit. Right. Money is like a rabbit coming out of the hat. Yeah, then you disappear in a cloud of smoke and it's all done. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> And then what you're do gone. you what do you recommend? You know, there's been a lot of conversation, um, and maybe maybe uh, it's a little overdone at this point. But there, you know, there was there's been a lot of conversation about like value, right? Business value, you got to deliver business value and that sort of thing. What what do you what would you say that means? Like someone, if someone's out there hearing that message as a data person, oh, you got to focus on value, right? Like what? How should they be thinking about that? They should ask what it means. Yeah. The person saying it, like, what do you, when you say value, like, what do you mean? I always ask this to people now. I always ask it to Chris and Matt, you know, who are working on the book, Chris Stapp and Matt House, yeah. they're working on it. And you know, I always ask him, um, you know, when you say value, what do you mean? You know, uh, partly because I think that, you know, we'll be, we'll be publishing a book together. So I want to understand what it is we're, we're <laughs> making. But, uh, but the underlying thing is, too, like, how well have you thought through this idea? Right. Um, and so, but business value is an interesting one. It's just, it's a, the kind of weasel words in some way, right? If you're not, if you're not paying attention, you know, again, going back to um, uh, you know, listening. Listening involves asking. So, you know, I would definitely, if somebody says, we have to add value, we have to get ROI, you know, this, this has to, um, you know, it has to be successful, right? ROI, successful value, all those words are, are things that you should definitely dive into and understand uh, what it is you're talking about. Um, because in a lot of cases, people are trying to rope you in to a project. So you need to understand what, what's success criteria uh, what does failure look like too, right? Mm. That's a big one. Um, you know, if it get killed off, what does that look like? What is it, what's the impact of that? Well, I'm pretty sure you know what, I guess you want really not to kill off, but, um, but yeah, no, that's the whole point. It's just that dive into it. Like when you say value, like what, what exactly are you talking about? Because because value at the end of the day, um, at least according to how I, I, I define it, and this is just coming from my own, an old um, book from the 90s called Lean Thinking, which is about um, applying lean to your enterprise, but value is, is um, ultimately what the customer perceives it as, as being valuable. There's nothing more, nothing less. And your job is to provide value to the customer, right? That could be a monetary thing. It could be something else. You could just be making somebody happy, right? But, but it's like, how do you maximize value? I think it's an open-ended question because there are open-ended types of value. It's not just financial value. I know people have the um, quote, show me the money, uh, thing and uh, but you got, you got to understand like whose money are you talking about? The interesting dynamic to this, and this is what I mean, is when you're an organization, sometimes there's a value that drives a needle for the organization, right? Uh, revenue, uh, the bottom line, and all this stuff, right? But then you have your shareholders; they have their own sense of value. And I, I wrote about this in one of my uh, substacks. Yeah, the golden rule of value, which which is basically he who holds the gold uh, uh, makes the rules. Yeah, right. <laughs> So uh, you see this often, right? Like a big company here, I think it was Qualtrics in, in Utah. They, they let off about um, almost 800 people yesterday. Why? Well, shareholders thought that'd be a great idea to do that. That, that. that decision added value to them. Did that add value to the people they laid off or the people that are left? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. Right? Um, but that, that's that's how value works. And so you always need to understand not just what value is perceived as, but, but who is it valuable to? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and organizations typically, and especially in very political ones, values a very um, nuanced thing because 
say that you and I are all running a company together, you and the, you know, the Dolly brothers, um, you know, say we're actually competing in a company. Let's make it interesting. So the Dolly brothers are, are um, colluding against me for some reason, right? They want more budget. And so to you guys, the, the issue of value is what's going to make both of your careers advance at the expense of mine, perhaps, or maybe not at the expense of mine, but I just happen to be in your way. So your value is going to be at the expense of mine because in different organizations, value is very much a zero sum game, right? In other cases, value might be a, um, might not be a, a zero sum game. It might be very mul multiplicative, like happiness. More happiness doesn't mean, doesn't cancel out, you know, right. uh, happiness somewhere else, right? So I think you really just need to understand like what, what the value means and you know, the trade-offs and who it's valuable for and so forth. And so when people, going back to your question about business value, um, that's where you just have to pay real close attention and not just take things at face value saying, oh, we're adding business value. It's like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, actually. Because so. Yeah. Um, and and you really need to, to keep in mind too. I mean, like the, you know, it's, it's uh, human beings that you're dealing with. Right. And, um, you know, the organizational initiatives that are going on are often driven by someone, someone has an agenda and that word often has a negative connotation to it. Right. But like, mm -hmm whether positive or negative, right? There's, I often have found over the course of my career that I, I was quite successful when I thought of my job as like, if I can use data to help the people I'm serving get promoted themselves, that will help get me promoted. It often felt that way, you know? Right. But you somehow understood this dynamic, yeah. right? Where it's, um, there's sort of this transitive effect Yeah. where um, if somebody bigger than you gets, uh, a promotion there for these smaller guppy in the, in the uh, fishbowl is going to also get a, exactly. a promotion, right? And so that that's, is exactly that's, that's, it. That's not, that's not the worst way to think about it. I mean, that, that happens. Well, that, that's true. Chaos, chaos is a ladder. That's what they. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I never heard that. That is one way that. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, but that's, that's reality of it, right? So when you hear the word value, always understand. But okay, so let me, let me tell you this. Um, there's an interesting uh, article that I, I saw in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, and I, po I posted it to LinkedIn, and I, I called it a. Uh, uh, FOMO driven development, fear of missing out driven development. And, and a lot of that is um, the article basically focused on how CIOs are pushing their CIOs and um, you know other technical executives to uh, come up with um, a generative AI uh, plan, right? Because everyone has to do generative AI now. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. uh, now you all get to be tasked with figuring this out. Like, where, where does generative AI fit to our business? And so what I imagine is going to happen is, is exactly what happened in other uh, machine learning and you know, other um, hype cycles where there's going to be a graveyard of POCs, right? And ultimately it won't add any value, but I've seen this before. I've seen it countless times uh, with yeah. machine learning and AI, especially where you know, everyone, everyone's hot on it. It seems like every few years you get hot on this stuff again. Every few years it's like, oh, it's going to change the world. It's going to change our business. And if you're not doing it, you're going to be swept under the rug by people who are doing it. To which I say, um, show me when that's happened so far. At some point that'll come true. Uh, I think at that some point, it's actually when, when AGI happens and companies are rendered useless, uh, period. Um, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So <laughs> the Terminator takes over corporate America. Um, but no, I mean, there, there's definitely use cases for it, but you got to understand, like, what are you trying to accomplish at the end of the day, right? It, it's, uh, but again, the, the, the executive, what, what's driving this, though, is the CEOs are accountable for boards. Mm -hmm. Boards are probably asking, okay, so what's the, what's your AI plan, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. CEO? Yeah. Right. And so that's he. And, you know, if you if you if you listen to the earnings calls uh, throughout the year, suddenly everyone's talking about AI. You didn't see this before November of 2022. Nope. Right. Everyone's talking about it now. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting, right? But if you don't mention this, you know, you know, you're probably gonna get dinged some points on the on the on the street, and your board's gonna say, okay, so let's get into the uh, you know the the. Uh, the mop room here and kick the crap out of you until you understand that generative AI, yeah. you're going to start talking about it. Yeah. You know, at, at least, uh, this time around, it's more, uh, the hype is in some ways more tangible than it was for a blockchain. Remember the <laughs> hype for that? Like, we're Everyone had a blockchain, uh, web three plan too. Like, remember yeah, that? Yeah. 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 And then never ended up being, <laughs> Oh man. But that, you know, if you, if you look back through manias and hype cycles, it's, you know, if for several hundred years, it's always how it's been. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. if you look back to railroads back in the day, it was, um, you know, there's thousands of railroad companies back in the 1800s. Um, you know, and, um, 
shipbuilding and all this stuff. So, I mean, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, there's utility. I'm not, I'm not questioning that, but it, it's, it's a question of um, where does this fit into what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how, how can you do this? And again, it comes back to the um, tools versus skills discussion, right? So if, if you understood, if you had the domain expertise, the competency and the skills to move the needle forward for your business, you'd also understand where these tools fit into place to solve your problems. But all too often, what I see now is everyone's like, well, I got to get the latest tool because that's obviously going to be the panacea that solves all of our problems here. And right. you don't even know what problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, so. yeah. I, yeah. I see that all the time. Um, and and yeah. really, it's I almost view like onboarding a new tool. The tool itself, if it like the opportunity that it gives you to solve problems, at, le at least in the context of a lot, a lot of the larger companies that I've worked with over the years, is yeah. that it actually opens a door for like cultural and process changes. That's, that's yep. actually what, what onboarding and, and oftentimes you can't get the budget and you don't get the relief from operational concerns in or that allow you to make those process and cultural changes unless you say, Oh, you know what, we're going to onboard this new, new tool. And so when it succeeds, yes, the new tool may have some new features. It's got better performance. Mm -hmm. You know, you're moving on prem to cloud. There are obvious advantages for, to doing that, but, Actually, what allowed you to succeed was was kind of the the people and process changes you made over the course of implementing the new tool. And the tool yeah. itself was just the Trojan horse for that. Yeah. It certainly yeah. happens. But what you say? I'm not saying I was it makes me wonder if like there'd be a way to frame it to like it's not a tool replacement project, it's a, a tool improvement or process improvement. Cause like, you know. A lot of companies like ripping out, I don't know, TM1 for something else. It's like, because they're sick of all the TM, TM1's, you know, BS or whatever. I mean, like a lot of the BS is the process BS. So like, it's not the tool. Is there a, <laughs> it's not that it's like, you're going to replace the tool and you're going to have similar problems unless you change the process. And you know, during the upgrade, exactly. pro, upgrade, you might incidentally fix those things because you're actually paying attention. But it makes me wonder if there's a way to like frame like, hey, it just it seems hard to get budget like, Hey, give us half a million dollars to keep using the same thing. You know, it's like, it sounds like a, it's a harder sell than like, Hey, look at this flashy new, exactly. to solve all these things that you're tired of dealing with, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, tools in a lot of cases just amplify what, what it is that you wanted to do anyway. Right. Um, I mean, hopefully, right. I mean, there are definitely some cases where sort of the reverse where tools uh, can um, introduce new ways of doing stuff. You see this a lot with ERP systems. Right, because ERP systems are so monolithic, it's going to force you to adjust to its way of doing yeah. stuff. Um, you know, and, and the ERP vendors always tell you that, oh, this is great because your processes are probably you know dog crap anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, and now we're going to grow you up and, and stuff. But then what happens though is inevitably uh, the um, you know the uh, uh, customization. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, we don't like how they make us do this. Let's go back to the old way. Way I had to do it. Yeah. And then you know the consultants come in. We spend a lot of money on that, so that's uh, mm -hmm. that's a fun racket to be in. If you guys want some longevity, I would say going to ERP uh, customization and maintenance. It's um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've right. been uh, involved in uh, the the analytics side of a uh, you know hundred million dollar ERP project, and yeah, <laughs> yes, and and what ended up happening. <laughs> was we ended up customizing the heck out of it, you know, and um, to the point where like new, this was, this was still in the on-prem days uh, where new, you know, we couldn't apply new versions of the software, right? Because it, it, we would have to spend six months customizing everything in order to apply the most recent patch because we had changed it so much. It's exactly what you described, Joe. <laughs> it happens all the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the, the, largely these companies, you know, the, this type of thing is immune to the effects of, uh, quote, AI. I mean, are you going to literally rip out your, your ERP system and replace it with a large language model? Yeah, exactly. Would you ever do that? <laughs> not, not next year. I'll, give you, not I'll write year. you a check right now for a thousand bucks. Anybody, anybody who said it could prove that they, they, they'll be willing to take that bet and do it. Yeah. yeah. Up, up to about All right. five, five All right, I think I think we've got some, some comments. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. Like Norris on-prem days, those aren't over yet. You know, that's true. Oh, dude, they're still here. On-prem? They're still here. If you look at stats on cloud penetration, uh, especially if you look at non-cloud vendors who are touting how much people are in the cloud, I, I, th I still think it's like maybe under 40%. It could. I've seen stats as low as 25%. 
Uh, most workloads are still on prem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aaron Wilkerson. We should get Arnold Schwarzenegger to record the, <laughs> record the phrase. <laughs> it's not the tool. <laughs> you probably make a deep fake for that. <laughs> I, I, it's probably really. I, there's probably like a, one of the like deep fake voice websites that are out now that already sure. has Arnold that you could just do mm -hmm. it. I yeah. wonder if he's on Cameo. Cameo. Does Cameo still exist? Do people do you remember Cameo that? still exists? In fact, I'm I'm, I'm part of their uh, their business influencer program. I have, to, I have to set up my video. Yeah, they have that. So I was ah, at, okay. at an event. I didn't know this was a thing. I was at an event in Denver, and then there, um, somebody was like, you should be on our business influencer thing. I was like, what is that? I was like, oh, you can send videos to people. I thought, okay, who, I'm fine, we'll talk. It's like, who, who, who wants you wishing happy birthday? That's my question. <laughs> well, it might be like happy... Um, yeah, happy birthday would be a weird one. Maybe in the something. office or like a, yeah, you know, welcome condolences back, welcome about back the Welcome to the office. Work remote. Yeah. Uh, remote work's done. <laughs> or remote work intro. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> my book sales will drop through the They're, they're going to use um, you to break the bad news <laughs> of return to office. Yeah, yeah. That would be um, – but no, they, they're still around, but I know that they did layoffs. Uh, so, so I read. I think there's maybe 50 people left there out of how many. I don't know. But that's an interesting one. That was a good idea at the time, you yeah. know, um, but uh, it was pretty killer. I, I like the uh, guy who played Kevin from The Office, whatever his name is. I think he was the highest grossing cameo act. Um, that's the, the, really? The guy with the bald spot. Yeah, 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 he was, like, mildly popular. Yeah. Um, and then who was it? Stanley Hudson, the guy who played him. Um, it's also super popular on there. I think uh, Monte Carlo – had him uh, reading something and he looked extremely enthusiastic uh, for his um, uh, demeanor. It was, it was pretty good. So, no, that's the thing. They're still around. I don't know. But yeah, Arnold, get Arnold to do a cameo for your show. Be great. It's not the tool. Uh, not the tool. Not the tool. Right. We got a uh, uh, friend of the show, Paul Mendelssohn. Uh, hey, what's saying up? Hi from, hi, Paul. from Israel. What's up, Paul? Good to have you Bugged here. late. Well, <laughs> Paul's yeah. one of our regulars. Um, uh, and uh, an IRL friend, um, Paul. Paul and I mm -hmm. used to live near one another in Wisconsin, <clears throat> and now I'm in Detroit, and he's in Israel. But um, <laughs> good to have you here, Paul. We got uh, Richard Ashton um, asking questions, getting to know the people at, uh, and setup of a business allows him to understand stakeholders, how stakeholders and teams operate, and what value looks like for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, make friends with people. You know? Yeah. Just like yeah, you should play machine learning. Yeah, it literally is. Um, it's 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 deep learning. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would urge people to look. I mean, I'm not sure of people's background in machine learning, but I, I, I that's you know, uh, I'd say a big chunk of my background is machine learning, right? But I, I'd urge people to dig under the hood and understand how this stuff works. People use the term AI. I mean, I was talking to my uh, my friend Maya about this. Um, she runs a, a machine learning company, and we we're just lamenting. Like, I guess we have to use this stupid term right now, even though it's literally not. AI, um, but everyone's calling it that. And just got, you got to meet people where they are too, you know. So, um, so generative. One of my friends, David Foster, wrote a, a generative uh, deep learning, right? And it doesn't have quite the range to it as generative AI, right? <laughs> as a book, but um, no, it's it's true. It's just applied machine learning, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I urge people to at least understand the basics of how this stuff works. It's it's fascinating, and I think you can definitely develop a better smell test as well for um, everything. So. Now, what do you think, I mean, in the kind of, you know, short term, what, what impact do you think this Gen AI is going to have on your average data practitioner out there? I think from writing code, I'm already seeing this. I think that that's an area where um, practitioners are going to see um, pretty big gains. But again, this comes back to the tool and, and skills discussion. If I could ever think of a perfect example, like where it's really good to have skills and knowledge, it's here. Because if you're asking a robot to generate code for you, um, you should obviously know yeah. if it looks good or not. Uh, you know, just being able to fact check your code. Just as you would if, if you asked it to write an essay for you. I'm pretty sure I would hope you would read through it and understand whether it's hallucinating or not. But it does hallucinate mm -hmm. on code too. But I think that that's the one area where you're, you're already starting to see a ton of um, traction is, uh, you know, software engineers, for example, you know, I know, I know senior and, and principal level engineers are using Copilot all the time, all the time. Right. And, and to me, that's, it's just, that's no different than autocomplete. It's just autocomplete on, on uh, steroids. So yeah. Um, you know, the anabolic kind. Uh, so, <laughs> but <laughs> 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 caveat there for me head friends out there. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's so it's interesting, but I, I think that's a productivity gains. I mean, so I've been nerding out a lot with text to SQL. 
I'm doing quite a bit of research for that for my book on data modeling. Yeah. Um, and also experimenting with different types of data models um, to see which will perform well. And, um, it, it, you know, text to SQL and, and data modeling are very closely related, but it, it's no different than if I had human write SQL and querying a database. If the data, if the data in the database is good and well structured, I'm going to get better answers. It's, it's yeah. pretty much part yeah. of the course. Um, because all these text to SQL models do is they, they infer um, from the column names. Um, and the data, you know, what are the types of data? And then what, if you were to ask me a query in natural language, what would be the most uh, probable um, query path through schemas, you know, and, and um, you know, through a database and so forth. So it's it's an intelligent way of introspecting, but it'd be no different than if you hired me as a consultant to come into your, your company on day one, I look at your database and try and write a query. And I'm like, I don't know if I need to find sales for customer. That looks like a customer field and that looks like sales. Mm -hmm. I will do that, right? It's, it's basically just automating that. And so I think that's still a bit longer ways to go to, let's say, be production ready. But the results I've seen so far, they're actually pretty dang good. Yeah, yeah. That's Passive. what I've seen too. I mean, it is it is very impressive. I, I wonder, what do you think? I mean, as far as kind of the the user facing experience. Do you think that that Gen AI or you know LLM driven chatbots are going to replace some degree of kind of the self service dashboard or you know the data kind of end user data exploration experience? Um, let me do this real quick. Um, I'm gonna. What are some fun things to do in Paris? Right. So I'm gonna ask this in Google. And then I'm going to compare it. Actually, I'm going to do Salt Lake City because that's where I live. So I'm going to answer your question. An example. Oh, AI power search isn't available for Salt Lake City. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so what I was going to do, though, is, OK, so so if you use Google right now, I mean, barred, they have barred results right next to the search results. Which ones do you click on more? I uh, click on the search results. Why? Uh, well, part of it's habit, right? Um, but I also, uh, I guess right now I, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Why do yeah, I, I, don't I, mean, trust, I don't trust that line yeah. barred? Right. Okay. So you, you, you tell me that you're going to introduce this to your business now. Right. Google has how much data? <laughs> Infinity. Right, and they have knowledge graphs built on top of this, and they, they and the, their answers. So I, I, so we were using this in London, right? My, my wife and I were trying to get around London, and she, she's using Bard for all the directions, and we got horribly lost, horribly yeah. lost. My, one time, my kid got stuck in the door of the train as it was going away, and I was like, oh crap! Like, <laughs> you know, thankfully the train stopped, and we got him out, but I was like, okay, I almost killed my kid too, um, and that was scary. But um, no, I mean, we were, she, she was relying on Bard, and even my kid was like, this seemed life school all the time. Like, why are you using it? Right? She's like, oh, it just gives me a good answer. I'm like, it's. No, no, not at all. Use maps like a normal person. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think at some point, sure. Right. But it, it's, I, mean, I think they even say, though, what, what does it say here? Yeah, it could be wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? So, so again, the question I always ask in my talks, in my data modeling talks, is um, who in this room is willing to bet their job and their salary by putting a large language model on top of your corporate data set today? Yeah, no, not, not doing and, that. And putting, yeah. putting that in front of end users, no way. Right. Only one person answered this with a yes, and then because and she was implementing a large language model at her company. Right? <laughs> well, there you go. It's it so cheating, yeah. <laughs> but even she said it was kind of hard. But the whole point is, it's you know, I, I, it's fun to talk about this stuff. Like, oh, it's going to change our enterprise. I'm like, okay, great. Today, you know, my my biggest litmus test is put your money where your mouth is. If you're willing to take a bet on this and take a bet. You know, but if, if, it, if it works, great. You, you actually will double your salary. We'll, we'll make you a VP. And if it fails, you know, and the, the, the reward is actually better than what you're going to get at your real job if you try to do this anyway. They're just going to give you maybe a, you, know, you get to keep your job. Right, right. You get an attaboy. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, good job. Here's a magician to come in and do some tricks for you during the uh, next uh, uh -huh. company launch show. And um, so... That's that's the reality of it. So I mean, there's just the risk and reward right now. I don't know if it's worth it, right? But yeah. it will be. I mean, I don't see this. So I see this as being inevitable. Like the cat's out of the bag on this. Um, mm -hmm. The other interesting thing with GPT though is if you looked at the user stats, I'm, I'm really curious what October looks like. But you know, web traffic was down to um, you know chat GPT site all summer, yeah. and it picked back up in, in spring. What I'm starting to think is this is basically the equivalent of a hand calculator for students. 
Yeah. I was saying this during the summer, you know, it was like they, this, my kids, you know, they use it, but they weren't using it during the summer because they're playing, you know, uh, Roblox and Minecraft. So. Yeah. That's um, what, now what do you, I know, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times you're working on the new data modeling book. Yep. What um, can you, can you tell us like, first of all, can you, can you define for us what a data model is? And then I'm curious, because when I started my career, like this is all we did right? Like everything had to go through a, a structured data model, at least uh, on the types of teams I was working on. It seems like we got away from that. Like what, what is a data model and what is the story of data modeling over the last decade? I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, the, the definition of data modeling will differ according to who you talk to. I think there will probably be as many definitions as people you talk to. Uh, I, I, in a nutshell, I define it as, um, you know, making data useful and valuable, um, you know, for decisions and knowledge for both humans and machines, right? Notice I didn't talk about Kimball, one big table, relational, any of that stuff. I think when you when you zoom out to the classical definitions of, of what data modeling is, is it's how do you how do you derive um, how do you best express reality with your data in a way that's going to um, quote add value, right? Again, it's in the eye of the beholder, but that's that's essentially what it. And I get a lot of this from Bill Inman, right? I mean, I talked to him, and he, he asked him one day what his true north was, and he said it's uh, believable and useful data. That's about it. Uh, yeah, I think that's um, good enough for Bill, good enough for me. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's essentially what the definition is. But what happened over the last ten years? I would say, uh, let's look about what happened over the last two decades. Like, I don't think this is a, a sudden thing, but um, you know, data modeling. There have been various connotations of this and various techniques that were developed over the years. Uh, to both think about data, I think at a conceptual and logical level, but then also at a physical level. Um, you know, the relational model, right? I mean, that, that came out in 19, no, it was just published in 1970 by Cod. That was really an attempt to, um, you know, uh, how do you best express data in, in tabular forms using set theory, right? And so that's, um, but yeah, it, it's not just tables. I mean, can, how do you express? I used to think of like entities and how they relate to each other, right? That's set there in um, predicate logic. But you know, that, that formed the basis for a lot of still how we how we interface with data. Kimball comes along and comes up with, I think is still a really good uh, idea for thinking about analytics, right? Um, you know, facts and dimensions and so forth. And those are the two canonical techniques, data vault to a lesser extent. I don't think it got as popular. Um, but what happened, right? And so uh, data became web scale back in the um, 2000s, late early 2000s, late 90s. This usher did a whole new way of, of dealing with data, right? I have to stream it. I have to sort it in, in systems that don't fit into relational databases. They just don't. That's why you have things like MapReduce and Dynamo and other databases come about. And I think along the way, the um, so big data is one of them. The, the cult of agile, I would say, is, is also a culprit. Uh, data is very, very much a thinking person sport. Right? I've been noticing, you know, if, if you you, know, you sort of software engineer, so I. I um, you know, if I contrast that experience with software, software is very much about focusing on, on what features are, are you going to deliver for the next sprint, right? Uh, data is different, especially when you think about how you're going to model data. You can't cram thinking or data modeling into two-week sprints. It doesn't really work that way. Thinking about the context of your business it takes time. It takes discussions. And that's something I think that we're trying to misapply, um, you know, quote, best practices in places where maybe it's not the best fit. And so I think that what, what happened though with Agile is now it's all about moving fast. So there's a pendulum I see between fast and formal. Formal is where you're going to do rigorous data modeling. You see it's still in Europe, right? Where they don't move as fast. Yeah. Here, I would say the techniques were just largely thrown into the wind because it's like, well, it's just move fast, you know, and the, the mantra for the 2010s is move fast and break things, right? It's more, more Zuckerberg wanted to do. Um, you know, along the way, uh, tools became easy to use, right? So what was once miserable uh, with, uh, um, you know, Hadoop and Hive and Spark, uh, especially with the manager yourself, all that became easier with the quote modern data stack, right? Which I, I consider um, November of 2012 to be the date that launched because that's when Redshift launched, mm. right? So you could rent a data warehouse for 25 cents an hour, not bad. I saw that and I was like, damn, pretty good deal. That opened up the floodgates. You know, five trend comes about, Snowflake comes out, you know, they came out with a paper in 2012 as well. And, and you know, I think that it, it, what it meant is, Data became democratized. The, the the ability for people to use very high, powerful tools, uh, the swipe of a credit card, um, you know, it was, it was I think both magical. But what what came at the expense of this 
and this goes back to the heart of the, the original point of this discussion, is there's a proliferation of tools now, right? But there's not a proliferation of good practices. We're substituting tools and technology for, um, you know, at a minimum best practices that we would formally have adopted back in the day, uh, as well as I think thinking critically about our business and how we apply data to it. And so the, the I, I would say the, um, the fact that, that data modeling is at a minimum on life support, possibly dead, I think that's that's symptomatic of where we are today because things have become too easy. So if you, why why do data modeling at all? If I can just throw data into you know um, you know one of the big cloud data platforms or a data lake house or whatever, um, and, I, and you know storage is super cheap, computes fairly cheap to throw up problems, and then why should I care? Right. And so I think this is where we are today. It's almost like, uh, you know, why eat this broccoli when I've got a Snickers is kind of how it feels sometimes. Um, do you think AI is going to be a forcing function when it comes to to data modeling? Like, uh, you know, is it is it going to, are you going to have to build more robust data models in order to get useful AI applications built? It's what I'm arguing for. If your underlying data model is, is you know, if it works better with, say, a Texas SQL model. I could argue that you're going to get better results. Um, the other, I would say, dark horse involved in this discussion are our knowledge graphs. Yeah, I think you're going to see the ascendancy of knowledge graphs. But knowledge graphs, if you put them on top of a of a, of a database or a data warehouse, it presupposes that the data in the data warehouse or databases um, also readable, right? And so again, it harkens back to a good data model. So I don't think the data model, a good data model, is an inescapable force of gravity in this situation. It always has been. Right now, we just monkey patch over everything, though. Yeah. Right. So we, we have data quality tests, data observability tests. And it's not even analytics that is a problem here. I think analytics people are typically dealing on the receiving end of dealing with whatever they have to deal with. But you're, what, where I'm more focusing my attention with my data modeling discussions, my book is actually upstream where data is created in the first place. That is your one chance to get it right. Mm. So I see it. You know, we think things are bad in the data, in quote, data world. It's a million times worse, you know, in the, uh, um, you know, with developers. So, so anyway, there's, it's a giant mess we created for ourselves and it's going to uh, take a bit to get out of here. But again, the reason I'm writing the book is if you like knowledge and skills, it, that's, that's how you beat it. So anyway, I know we're coming up to the top of the hour yep. here, so uh, we'll be respectful of your time, but yeah, thanks to the audience. Great questions. And um, yeah, you, uh, Joe, so where can people, um, uh, you know, what, um, I always end with, with the last, last question, right. And that's just, uh, what advice do you have for someone who's who's entering a young person who's entering the the data world right now what what would you tell them to focus on don't do it become a plumber <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well there you go um become a plumber plumber you heard, you heard it here uh from joe reese yeah get, get a real job this is it's, it's I'm yeah just joking. if you really want to do it i would say just just again master the fundamentals um you know get get good at what you do you know and, and then just understand to be to, don't just be good, become great. If you're gonna do this, do it, right? Put in the time, put in the work. So just know it's gonna take a while, that's all. And do your best. That's... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Joe. Okay, thank you. All right, let's see. Any last uh, words here? We got a couple points of order before we let everybody go. Um, of course, we want to remind you uh, meet the Super Data Brothers coming up. So DBT Coalesce, I will be there. Day to Day Texas, Eric and I will be there. Joe will be there. I'm um, lots of yep. awesome speakers. If you go to the Day to Day Texas website and just look at the the speakers list, it is it is just like redonkulously good. Um, use code Super Data Brothers to get a discount on your Day to Day Texas registration. Yeah. yeah. One one more thing. Uh, if it's your first time tuning in, we're the Super Data Brothers. Um, Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. We're live every Thursday at right. noon Eastern. That's right. Um, we gotta 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 uh, feed the algorithm. The algorithm demands likes. Uh, so mm -hmm. please, if you don't mind. Um, and then finally, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Digital Hive. Digital Hive is an analytics catalog that lets you bring analytics assets from Tableau and Click and Power BI and lots of other places together into a single portal that makes it easy to find. Uh, those assets, to interact with those assets, combine charts from different BI tools into one place, and also as a data team gives you a degree of 
auditability and insight into what people are doing in what tools that we always argue here at the Super Data Brothers Show is invaluable. If you're not doing BI on your BI, you're doing it wrong. So uh, check out Digital Hive, and we want to thank them again for today's sponsorship. All right. Uh, and a big thank you to Joe for coming on the show. Um, you know, he's, uh, I think, dropping lots of wisdom. I, for one, am really looking forward to this uh, data modeling book when it comes out. I think it's just like such a timely thing. And um, and I think Joe will be a great messenger to help evangelize the good news of data modeling, right? Let's Let's get organized and think about how to turn data into something truly useful and understandable by human beings. And that's what a data model is ultimately all about. So I look forward to seeing that from Joe. Any last words, Eric? No, I think that about covers it. All right. Well, until next time, uh, I am Ryan. I am Eric. And we are the Super Data Brothers. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.